good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity, for inviting me, for being here. So this concentration, uh, this presentation will concentrate uh, on cancer and uh, on a therapeutic approach that we call PKD, which is an abbreviation for periodic ketogenic diet. Uh, when it comes to any uh, chronic internal diseases, we have uh, three questions to ask in general. The first question is, what is the major factor underlying chronic diseases? Then the second question is, what are the resulting groups? And the third question is, how diet, or specifically the PKD, works um, in these conditions? Uh, the first answer is that um, uh, the PKD helps those conditions that are coming from carbohydrate overconsumption. This includes uh, type 2 diabetes, obesity, and many other conditions. So this is quite obvious. Uh, then the second factor is uh, not as well known as the previous one. It is the food uh, items that are causing an increased intestinal permeability and an increased permeability of the other membranes in the body too. Uh, the PKD, the diet I will be speaking of, is a diet that is eliminating those food items that increase intestinal permeability and thereby uh, can be used uh, to control for these conditions. Uh, and the third factor is uh, food additives, chemicals, anything artificial, supplements, uh, that may cause uh, certain conditions, including epilepsy, panic disorder, and uh, uh, certain cardiac arrhythmias too. So if we eliminate these um, items from our diets, we can have a control over these conditions. Now, I will concentrate on the middle one, the second factor. So this is the PKD. How do we define, do we define the PKD? So this is an animal meat fat-based diet, which has two versions. On the left, you can see a full animal meat fat-based diet um, that is uh, specifically designed for those who have any more serious disease. Uh, on the right, you can see a diet that may allow for some vegetables and fruits, and between the two, there is a continuum. Uh, the PKD has a few very specific rules. Um, maybe I will go into uh, later. Uh, the next question um, we, we do very often get, why do we call it PKD and not carnivore? So the reason is that there is a background and a history uh, behind these words. So on the left uh, hand side you can see the periodic line starting with Walter Wartlin uh, and the researchers and the clinicians who uh, succeeded him along uh, the same lines. Uh, and on the right hand side you can see the ketogenic uh, diet line uh, starting with uh, Russell Wilder uh, 100 years ago and the people who succeeded him. Uh, we combine the two approaches to combine the benefits and exclude the shortcomings. So, in terms of your plate, this is the PKD again. On the left, you can see an animal meat-based uh, version, full, uh, for more serious diseases. On the right, you can see the one that may allow uh, for some vegetables, a side dish, for example. Okay, so this is a concept uh, that we need to talk about uh, a little bit before we jump into the case studies. So intestinal permeability uh, is, is a key to understanding cancer and its recovery. The intestine has a dual function. It is subserving absorption and it is also functioning as a barrier between what we eat, the lumen of the body, the lumen of the, the bowel and the rest of our bodies. Uh, the combination of the two function is resulting um, something that is called selective uh, intestinal permeability, and this is really a key to the healthy functioning of the body. Um, intestinal permeability is brought about uh, by a succession of the events that you can see here, starting with bad food items and resulting in an end in a fully developed autoimmune disease or cancer. Uh, in addition to developing intestinal permeability with time, 
it is likely that somebody will also develop an increased permeability of the other membranes throughout the body. This may include blood-brain barrier or any membrane that is enveloping any of our internal organs. Um, and then there is a third concept here, and this is uh, compromised cell junctions uh, that are a result uh, of certain bad food items, uh, which also means uh, a loss of contact inhibition uh, within the tissues. And this is something that is a hallmark of any cancerous tissue transformation. So this is the point where uh, cancerous uh, tissue transformation starts, whatever tissue we are speaking of. Okay, so we have a few questions here. What is affecting intestinal permeability? What are the consequences? And once we developed it, how we can reverse it? It has been acknowledged by many, many including this paper, that it is, it is the very time to treat intestinal permeability because then we will be able to cure these uh, so far incurable diseases. But there has been no answer to how exactly because there have been uh, quite a few attempts uh, that are listed here uh, to treat intestinal permeability, but none of them proved to be successful. For example, we have this study here with a standard paleo diet, which looks like uh, which looks like here. Uh, this diet, at least in this study, was not able to reverse an elevated intestinal permeability and was not able to keep inflammation level uh, low either. So this is not uh, even if this is uh, called uh, a more or less healthy diet. Uh, this was not enough to normalize intestinal permeability. Actually, the very first evidence uh, that a diet or any intervention can uh, reverse elevated intestinal permeability is coming from our case study in 2016. Uh, this is a patient with Crohn's disease, with a very, very elevate, um, advanced Crohn's disease. And uh, in this patient, this was the first intestinal permeability measurement that was done when the patient still had symptoms. Uh, the patient was put on a PKD diet and in a few months uh, he showed uh, the second measurement, which is lower than the first one. So this was the first occasion uh, that we saw that elevated intestinal permeability uh, normalized and along with this change there has been um, a massive improvement in his symptoms, in his blood work and his ultrasound. But we did see the same uh, before-after changes in many other cases. These are healthy controls, so not patients yet, who are coming from an ad diet, including the standard paleo diet here, and these two were initially following the Western diet. Uh, and this is their uh, first uh, intestinal permeability measurement. So anything that is uh, higher than the dotted line above is regarded as being high. Uh, they were following the diet, the PKD, for a few weeks, and this was their second measurements already. Uh, and for the third uh, subject, uh, we also have uh, a measurement that was done at one year on the PKD. So this is a pattern that we uh, very consistently see when uh, anybody is doing a change uh, towards eating PKD. This uh, patient um, is, a, is a Hodgkin lymphoma patient with uh, extremely high intestinal permeability in the beginning. At this time, he was following a regular keto diet and have been taking lots of supplements. And, and this is the resulting intestinal permeability, very high. It is not enough to eat a low-carb diet. Uh, then the patient uh, upgraded the keto to eating a PKD diet, and this was the result in four months. Uh, this was paralleled by an improvement in his symptoms. Uh, then the next case, uh, this is a brain cancer case, low-grade uh, glioma. You can see the first measurement here, the second measurement at six months. Uh, so you can see that there is a decrease, and uh, during the same uh, period of time, there has been no increase in the tumor size, um, while there has been a, a constant growth 
previously, before the patient started doing PKD. Uh, next patient is an ovarian cancer patient uh, coming from a regular paleo diet, having high intestinal permeability, which went back to almost normal. Okay. Um, these are the uh, studies that we have already published in, in journals. And just to give you a, a little bit of update, uh, this patient here is still progression-free at 7.5 years with a cervical intraepithelial neoplasia without any symptoms. This patient is uh, progression-free still at 8.5 years uh, with soft palate cancer, and this patient uh, is still alive. We do not know more about this patient other than he is alive. So these are uh, quite long survivors. Uh, these are the cancer types that we see most frequently uh, in our practice, and the ones uh, that are highlighted now are the ones that I include in the next part of my presentation. But before doing this, here's a little bit of statistics uh, that I did a few quite a few years ago, so this is not very up-to-date, uh, but we asked the question of what is predicting uh, a successful outcome, successful patients, and uh, this is how we defined uh, being successful as a cancer patient, uh, being progression-free at the two years mark. And we looked at what do these patients have in common, so these are the relatively uh, successful patients at least, and we, we looked at what they have uh, in common. So here are the basic data, and uh, the outcome was that all those patients uh, that were progression-free at two years follow-up uh, were not doing uh, chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So here we have seven such patients. Uh, by contrast, there has been no single patient hitting the two-year progression-free mark who did uh, either radiotherapy or chemotherapy. Um, so, um, uh, th this is not a full statistics, there are a lot of limitations um, to this analysis and a lot of dropout too. Uh, so, just uh, regard this <coughs> as, as an information here. But we do see a very similar pattern across many other patients with cancer. <coughs> okay, uh, I will show you now a few case studies. Uh, and I will touch on the benefits that you can achieve uh, with the PKD. So the first benefit, obviously, is survival, is something that we all want. So we, here we have this glioblastoma case. Um, um, currently, this glioblastoma case is the longest progression-free uh, glioblastoma case uh, survival in the literature, and uh, he is seven years on the PKD altogether. 8.5 years overall survival. <clears throat> and there has been no uh, radiotherapy or chemotherapy since doing the PKD. Uh, this case has been um, uh, published uh, as a preprint, so you can look it up, but has never been accepted for some reason in, in any journal. This is his intestinal permeability measurement, uh, normal, which um, um, predicts um, stable disease and uh, survival. So these are the consecutive uh, MRIs. This has happened while the patient was still following the standard way uh, surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy. There has been a progression in the end. At this point, the patient decided stopping doing radiotherapy and chemotherapy, doing PKD alone, and since then he has been stable. Uh, currently stable for already seven years. Okay, and um, this is the so-called Kaplan-Meier statistics for cancer survival, and this is specifically for glioblastoma, and, and the sample is uh, from the UK. So here you can see uh, the survival in months, and here you can see how many patients are still alive at a certain uh, time. You can see that the window on, only is limited to 60 months, because there is basically almost nobody uh, outliving this window, but our patient is way beyond this window. So normally this would be associated with almost zero survival here. Okay, second case with glioblastoma. Uh, this patient uh, was operated on 
shortly after diagnosis, and then he, she went on uh, with a PKD alone. As you can see, consecutive MRIs showed no uh, increase. Actually, there has been a slight decrease, too. This is uh, the very last uh, um, MRI, and, and this is uh, the so-called cerebral bulb volume. A scan from the MRI and this shows activity level. As you can see, there is no activity at the side of uh, her tumor here. So even if it is visualized structurally, uh, there is no uh, activity in terms of cerebral blood volume. Uh, so I can go on with successful cases, uh, but we often get the question whether are really uh, all patients that successful? Uh, and the answer is no, but we very often can tell the difference uh, between successful and the unsuccessful, least successful patient. So this was a patient who was operated on here. Uh, then he went on with a PKD alone for two months. And during this time, there has been no tumor growth. You can see here, stable condition. He had no symptoms whatsoever. He had no seizures whatsoever. No medication was needed. At this time point here, he started using radiotherapy because his oncologist uh, persuaded him to start doing radiotherapy. And from this time on, uh, the disease started progressing. Uh, despite the fact that uh, later on he started doing HBOT, dietary supplements and other medications to counteract the negative effect of the radiotherapy that nothing helped, the disease just progressed and in the end, here, the patient died at eight months after uh, being diagnosed. Okay, just uh, to show you the contrast between successful and unsuccessful. So this was patient one, uh, still progression free at eight years uh, without doing anything uh, outside PKD, but he stick to PKD very well. This patient stick to PKD also very well, uh, as evidenced by many laboratory blood works and uh, many interviews with him. Uh, but since starting doing radiotherapy and anything at on, he, he died uh, in the end at eight months. Okay, uh, this is the fourth case, uh, a child with uh, grade one ganglioglioma uh, type brain tumor. Uh, he underwent a residual surgery. Uh, but uh, the next uh, follow-up MRI showed that there has been progression in the size of the tumor. Then the next two MRI also showed progression of the tumor, despite the fact that this is uh, expected to be a low-progressing tumor. So this uh, progressed quite rapidly. And at this point, the parents of the child decided uh, to put the child on a PKD and uh, the next MRI uh, was stable um, for the first time in his disease history here. Uh, the child is uh, improving his symptoms and there is no, um, no progression since then, currently already for three years. This was the first uh, control MRI. You can see the location of the tumor. Uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is stable. And this patient also didn't receive radiotherapy or chemotherapy. Okay, this is how we uh, control for um, adherence. Uh, these are uh, quite uh, detailed blood works. Um, you will not be able to see the very details, uh, but I used to highlight uh, the outliers uh, in a color. So anything higher than expected is highlighted in pink. The, the low outliers are highlighted in blue, but there is not many outliers, so this is a very good adherence level. Uh, what's the most important outcome from the laboratory is the inflammation level, uh, which has been assessed by uh, CRP, fibrinogen, and ESR, which remained low, predicting survival. Okay, then the next um, case is a brain cancer diffuse astrocytoma. Uh, so far, I, I've been speaking about skipping radiotherapy, chemotherapy. In this, uh, in this patient, it was possible to skip surgery and put the patient on a, a wait-and-watch approach uh, because this was his uh, personal preference. 
Um, and these are the, the consecutive MRIs. This is the three months uh, PKD. Uh, this patient only had uh, very mild symptoms, uh, very small facial spasms, which are epileptic seizures. Uh, actually, but the number of these uh, seizures went down since uh, following the PKD. Um, since this tumor is quite big and there is a lot to risk uh, and a lot to lose uh, for a highly intelligent and uh, educated, young, uh, very well functioning uh, patient, this, this, this is a reasonable choice to, uh, to watch and wait before running into surgery. But it, it is not advisable for everybody. Okay, then the second group of the benefits is symptom improvement. I'm going to show you another glioblastoma case. Uh, we do have a program that uh, includes a two-week day-by-day follow-up. This is uh, the data that we received during the follow-up. So here are the glucose and the ketone levels in a specific range. And this is how his uh, symptoms, the tumor-associated symptoms change. Uh, he had paresthesia of the left leg and the left arm, and these symptoms went down. Then the, the other most important symptoms that we have with brain cancer patients is the fatigue. Uh, in brain cancer patients, it takes usually a longer time uh, to normalize. Uh, fatigue, uh, for example, in this patient, it took six months before fatigue went down to uh, a, a very low level. But if the patient is, uh, is sticking to the diet, uh, the result will come. Okay, so this is a summary of what you can expect in brain cancer, specifically from the PKD. So you can have a control over tumor growth. You can have a control over the epileptic seizures. Uh, symptom control, uh, and the next one is an important one. With time, an inoperable tumor may turn into an operable tumor. And you can achieve medicine freedom. <clears throat> and uh, this is a comparison I leave for you. Uh, what you can see from traditional treatments and the additional medication that is uh, required uh, to counteract the side effects of radiotherapy and chemotherapy. So this is a, a rolling ball. Okay, next uh, patient is a, is a bronchial cancer. Uh, this patient had uh, severe breathing difficulties because there has been a tumor obstructing uh, her, her bronchus. Uh, and these symptoms went away in five months. Uh, you can see that the tumor went away too. You, you, you cannot see the tumor itself. You can see that the diameter of the bronchus increased uh, over time. Next case uh, is a metastatic cancer. Uh, this patient uh, originally had breast cancer and then she was operated on. And then uh, across the next five years, she received uh, uh, several cycles of uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and hormonal therapy. But in the end, uh, the disease recurred, and then uh, metastasis appeared in the liver and in the hip bone. Uh, at this point, the patient stopped doing uh, these therapies here and went uh, on with the PKD alone. And as a result, <clears throat> there has been a regression in the ultrasound and the PET scan. Uh, PET CT. I'm going to show you the, the, the scans. So this was a PET CT uh, at the PKD onset. This is the liver lesion. This is the hip bone in uh, lesion. Uh, these metabolically active spots that went away uh, in six uh, months. <clears throat> you can see the respective uh, numbers here. And uh, during uh, the, the six months, we, we also do uh, <clears throat> ultrasounds on a regular basis to have a better resolution of what is happening. And we, and we saw that the diameter, so these are the three diameters of the tumor, uh, got smaller across time. Okay, this is the blood work. Uh, the major inflammation factors remained low, predicting good result. Uh, a few other markers uh, looked as expected. Okay, another possible benefit is having no recurrence uh, following surgery. This is a colon cancer case now at three years. <clears throat> this tumor uh, was here in the flexural hepatica. She was operated on, and since then she's doing a PKD alone approach. This is her 
uh, history of the events. This is where the PKD started. You can see that CRP remained normal and imaging showed no recurrence in this patient. Uh, this is just to visualize uh, the laboratory parameters across time. So uh, again, uh, the, the numbers that are in color are the outliers, either positive or negative. And these laboratory alteration all went away on the PKD. And this is how the CRP changed. Uh, this was a standard diet associated with high CRP. Um, the very first one was way before diagnosis. And uh, CRP was causing certain low on the PKD. OK, then the next case is, uh, <clears throat> is a recurrent uh, cancer in the oral cavity. Um, Actually, here at this uh, part, this was a T4 advanced tumor. Um, this is a patient's history. Um, here, uh, the patient started a PKD uh, and he had two consecutive control imaging, uh, both showing no recurrence and having low, relatively low CRP uh, levels. Okay, again, the CRP. Here before standard diet and on the PKD. Okay, then the next um, slide is about uh, the next group of the benefits counteracting chemotherapy induced side effects. Um, so this patient was already for, uh, on, a, on a chemotherapy when she started doing the PKD and she came to us with nausea, headache, fatigue, poor sleep. Uh, and as you can see, all these symptoms. Uh, uh, decreased gradually once she started doing the PKD. So these are the consecutive days in the initial follow-up. Uh, actually, this patient was very hesitant with starting the PKD because uh, she was uh, that nauseous that she couldn't even think of meat and fat. So it took some time uh, for her to embark on the diet. But once she started doing the diet, then the nausea went away. Okay, then the next group is about uh, improvement in the other symptoms and allowing for tapering down medications. Uh, this is a bladder cancer uh, patient uh, where we have a, a four months a month follow-up and we can also ask here whether does age matter with a PKD or with a, with a cancer treatment because this patient was uh, 83 years old when starting the diet. Uh, again, the history of the events, he had a, a long and rich history of uh, medical conditions and uh, lots of interventions. Uh, when we first met this patient, he was taking 10 medications and four uh, supplements. Um, then uh, he was put uh, on a PKD and uh, due to his uh, age and fragile condition, his uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy was postponed. So. He was left uh, basically without um, any conventional treatment. So this has been a reasonable choice to <clears throat> go with the diet therapy. And since then, he's in a stable condition. We are currently waiting for uh, his CT. Uh, this is the summary of his first two weeks. Um, you can see that despite the history of 25 years old, of 25 years of uh, diabetes, glucose was quite low. His weight started to going down, blood pressure started to go down. Uh, this was how his medications uh, were tapered down already in, in two weeks. So now he is only one medication instead of the 10 that he was taking before. And, and this is his symptoms. There are a lot of up and downs, but, but this is happening with such cases when there is a lot of things going on in the, in the very first two weeks. Okay, so this is what is predicting survival in our experience, uh, high diet adherence, uh, not taking medications and supplements, uh, surgery whenever, wherever possible, uh, then no chemotherapy, no radiotherapy, and no, possibly no medical intervention that may interfere with the PKD diet uh, effectuation. <clears throat> Uh, and, and this is our, uh, our team. I would like to <clears throat> uh, mention Dr. Uh, Rika Horvath, who is uh, currently our uh, number one physician. 
she is doing an immense job with, uh, with patients and in the picture you can see our uh, dietary advisors and, and other group members. Um, and uh, yes, all together they are speaking seven languages. So uh, if a patient comes to us, um, he or she may have a possibility to, to do the diet education part in, in their own language. And uh, <clears throat> this is a book I would like to introduce. This uh, was written and photographed by our uh, dietary assistant, Natalie Daniels. So <clears throat> anybody who, is, uh, who would like to have a closer relationship uh, with the PKD, uh, you can look up this book. I, I also have one with me. So after the presentation, you can come and take a look at it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sophia.